If I had the smallest thing, we'll tear it apart. I wish sometimes I could trade you in. I fall in love with you again and again. Hey, my heart, don't leave me. Hey, my heart, can't you see? I fall in love with you always. Hey, my heart, let's fly away. Say the words will go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am so glad to see you here tonight, and uh, I can't wait for you to see what's in store for you. My name is Aaron Kleinard. Uh, I see so many familiar faces from the community, from friends, from people who love High Point, people who are interested in High Point and want to find out what we're going to do in High Point. So uh, a special welcome to, to all of you. I'm going to dispense with uh, recognitions tonight because uh, we have a lot of information that uh, Mr. Duwani wants to present to you. I do want to say another special thanks to High Point University for being so kind in offering these facilities to us because it's a perfect place to do what we're going to do tonight. It's just real interesting to, to see the amount of support that they give all of us here in this community. So let's give High Point University a round of applause. <laughs> I told somebody earlier tonight, I have no idea what I'm going to say tonight, but I'm going to speak to you from my heart. I cannot tell you the amount of time and effort and hours and talent that has been put into what you're going to see tonight. Uh, I'd be less than honest if I told you I've seen this, because I haven't. <laughs> I'm going to be just as surprised as you are, so I'm nervous as a house cat to see what it is High Point's going to look like. Uh, but I know that um, from all I have seen exhibited in the 11 meetings that we've had over the last week and a half, you are not going to believe it. You just won't believe it. I am going to take exception and do one introduction and one thank you that, that I don't think we can do without tonight. I would like for all of the members of the Duwani team who are here tonight to please stand up and let us thank you with our applause. Gentlemen, ladies. These folks are real pros, and you're going to see that uh, with evidence in a few moments. One last thing I want to say, and then I'll turn the program over to, uh, to the man. This is just the beginning. What you're going to see tonight uh, is the result of hours and days and weeks of work. What happens next, though, is just as important. About 300 high pointers have been coming to the charrettes over the past week and a half to share their ideas of what we should be and, and what we should have and what high point needs. We've been making our own dream. So tonight you're going to see that dream in pictures and words from, again, the very best in the world, Andreas Duwani.
Before I forget, in a kind of a mutual admiration society, uh, I'd like to thank Aaron for shepherding me through much of uh, much that is important. You know, you walk in uh, uh, to meet me, and I don't really know who you are. And it's uh, my tendency to treat everybody rather well. And he actually uh, corrects me in that regard. He says, <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm kidding. But, uh, uh, but Aaron has been a great shepherd. Uh, he and Wendy Fusco have um, done a tremendous job raising the very substantial amount of uh, funds that were necessary to do this kind of work. And of course, we have the local partner, uh, 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 Peter Freeman, who uh, may actually have conceived this whole thing. You know, uh, uh, a resident, uh, an architect, of course, our uh, joint venture partner, but he might have conceived this for the sake of his town. And I think for him and for his son and his wife, it's critical that this be a place worth living in. You know, it's really, and I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the goodwill in this town is autobiographical. You know, people come in and say, I love it. Uh, what can you do? And I, w I want you to make it more lovable, in fact. You, you care for it. Uh, there's also um, uh, Nito Cobain, who is, uh, I don't think that if he hadn't somehow been so enthusiastic, when I first came, came to speak here about six months ago, he was enthusiastic about the, the messages. And I, I don't know, because I haven't been told, but it could be that High Point University provided the most substantial contribution to the fee. And, um, and I think a lot follows from that. You know, uh, it's a very, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous leadership position in this city. So I want to thank them. And I promised uh, uh, Wendy to please mention economics. And I think that I only speak of economics when I speak, but uh, it's a very roundabout way uh, of doing so. And it is to make this place uh, worth living in as a result of it being a, a place that actually can provide jobs and a life uh, for the next generation and the generation after that. Over the, oh, over the, uh, the week, and it's only been a week since I spoke to you last Wednesday, let me leave this alone. Uh, over the week, I, have, um, I had a very simple conception of what had been happening here, you know, in terms of the, of the international um, market centers and this very strange relationship you have to your downtown, which is dominated by a single entity. It's the most complete monoculture I've ever seen, you know, the International Marketing Center. It serves you well because it, it pays a great deal of taxes, but on the other hand, uh, when it's gone, uh, the whole downtown hibernates. And you've actually adjusted to this very peculiar position. And for us, that was the principal reality. And I'm, I'm going to get back to that. Um, the situation to remember is that we as planners are futurists. And while you have a reality in which you are experts, you uh, know much better than I ever will what this is really like, we have a kind of discipline which is about the future. You know, um, sometimes a little scary, but we extrapolate. Uh, spend a lot of time thinking about what the 21st century will be like and reading and so forth. And it's gonna be a difficult century. It's gonna be very challenging. It's not gonna be like the 20th. And we really do have to think differently because there's been an all, a very too many barnacles and accretions that have occurred and bad habits, actually, that have occurred as a result of the excessive wealth that we experienced towards the end of the 20th century. And a lot of it is gone. And I'd like to remind you that even though we've had three essentially overlaid crises in the 20th century that have really given us a shock, the real estate bubble, the consciousness of climate change, not, perhaps not the reality, but the consciousness of climate change, you know, there's, it's casts a pall on you that you know, big bad thing may be happening. And also peak oil. You know, uh, you might say, well, what's peak oil? We just discovered the shale this and the, you know, that. Just ask an airliner that can't serve you peanuts. Uh, the problem is that we're not gonna run out of oil. The problem is that it'll never be cheap again. And so we have a situation in America in which the tremendous advantage we have had with land, you know, being a continental nation we can move, we can spread out, we can have big lots, we can drive everywhere, we can assume that everybody will have a car, actually becomes a disadvantage. 
and the constrained little European cities suddenly have an advantage. The fact that you can get in Germany from one city to the other in an hour, and here it takes a very long time, used to be an advantage, all the land, now it's a disadvantage. So we have to get ready for the 21st century. In the 21st century, the first generation is now 20 to 25 year old. You saw how, how young my crew was. That, those, it's, it's, it's their century. And if this is not recognizable to you, it's because we're designing for them. Now, in an interesting way, we had no choice but to design for them. And it goes like this. By the way, before I say anything, I know that you are pleased to hear that you're unique. You will be pleased. Everybody is always pleased to hear that their town is unique. And the only, li I'm a very straightforward guy, but I always lie. And I say, you are indeed unique, because it's, it's just the way it gets you in the door. Most American cities are absolutely not unique at all. <laughs> They're virtually interchangeable. You know, there's a couple of dozen that are unique, but American cities are very, very similar. You actually are unique. <laughs> and not in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I see. A commitment to an incredibly successful industry for 100 years, a great, a great achievement that has made you world famous, and a position that is now in decline. And that decline is never going to crash. You do have an extraordinary geographic location and an embedded culture and a whole list of things. This will never shut down as a furniture center, but the competition is everywhere arising. You know, Atlanta, this, Dubai, the Chinese, and so forth. So what you have here is a glide downwards, a glide. And I don't think that's news to you. The high point may have been, let's say, 2002, 2004. But there's a glide. And, uh, and things there are changing. Um, you have heard me earlier say, perhaps, in one of these 11 meetings, that I do think that you actually have to get ready for a crash, you know, for something in which you, know, you have to really switch out your current commitment, your current single, as it were, taxpayer downtown. I don't think you have to switch out. I'm not convinced that it's going to be a glide. But what you need to do is keep the young people. And that becomes the theme. And keeping the young people of the 21st century is very different from the, from the 20th. Okay, and that's why this plan is both unique to you, it's going to seem as special to you, and it's unique to us. So I'm going to now start. Okay. This slide, your downtown is absolutely empty, okay, and we walk it because we work downtown, and it is absolutely clean. That is very odd. <laughs> Most empty downtowns are decrepit. You know the pictures of Detroit, right? They're empty and falling apart. Your downtown is empty and impeccable. Uh, this morning, there were two people out there killing weeds. Uh, lest they grow in this juncture <laughs> between, the, between the concrete and the asphalt. Okay, as a doctor looks at your eyes and your skin and says you're healthy or not, I can look at the maintenance level of your downtown and say you are doing well economically. But there's a peculiar situation in that it's completely empty. The people we used to, it was funny, w walking around was us. We would see each other. The team would meet each other. <laughs> That's all we saw. OK, so you have the situation. This is the team, Wendy in the front in the colorful dress. And um, you should know that the team actually is in itself. We, I, am not an expert. The team as a whole is expert. And it's the combination of our method of the charrette, which is all about uh, learning what's local, and uh, Peter Freeman with local know-how. Okay, so Peter knows the local stuff. We know the general theory. Together, we are a, a, an intelligent team. Individually, we're not complete. But because Peter and his office has been present the entire time, there's a transference that occurs, and he is now an expert on this plan. And so when you ask us who takes over now, I might be called in for emergencies, but essentially, you have a team in place that knows how to move this forward. Okay? This is you. Uh, you provided the third leg of your local concerns. Now, 
An interesting thing happened during the charrettes, these 11 meetings. By the way, Aaron, it wasn't 11 meetings. It was about 20 meetings. Because every time I stepped outside to a parking lot, every time I had dinner, it turned into a meeting. And I think it has to do uh, due to wonderful public relations. People could identify us, and they would come out of the bars and pizza joints and talk to us. So I consider this to be a 20 meeting uh, charrette. But you people here, with very, 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 very few exceptions, it was entirely a positive uh, experience. The meetings were very different from the usual American meeting. And I think the negativity, the skepticism, the belly aching in other charrettes come from fear. There's a fear that, you know, most of the time we're brought in when a, when a, when a city is in trouble way in trouble, way in trouble, and it's hard to pull out. You are not in trouble at all. You're not in trouble. You might be in decline, but you're not in trouble. And I think there was an absence of nervousness in these meetings that gave it a much, much easier tone. There, was that, there wasn't that kind of fear, that kind of resentment, that kind of thing, which is so common in, in the public discussion in America. And that comes from the fact that you're economically viable and you're catching the decline early, really early, and so you're not nervous or resentful. Uh, there was an awful lot of work done, uh, people giving their opinion, uh, as we see in this enormous stack, beautifully handled. The newspaper was excellent as well. And uh, what, here's something, one came in like this, which I love. Okay, somebody actually came in, it could be one of you, and placed an order as if it were a restaurant. Okay, you may note that I never wrote anything down during the charrette. When you said something, we need this, we need that, I didn't write it down because that gives the impression that because you ask for it, it will happen. And that's not the way it works. Okay, there was pushback immediately when something was said that was unrealistic, that you didn't need, that was a little bit of a, you know, absolutely unnecessary. I tried to kill it as, as quickly as I could. But anything that had a chance, we brought to life. And I think you're going you're gonna to recognize some very late additions, like you need an assembly hall downtown. When did we hear that? Day before yesterday, for the first time. Perhaps it was even, I don't think it was yesterday, but the day before yesterday. At one point, we heard, what about a transit line? And the next day, we had a proposal. So anything that has a chance that made sense, we brought to life but we didn't bring everything to life. We also stayed inside our boundaries. There was, much, there was a lot of call. What about me? What about this? What about Washington Street? What about the Southwest? We said, no, we're staying inside the line, you know, because there's enough to do right there. It's a really big place that we had to work with, and also it's four places, as you will see. So uh, the, most of the pushback that I did was saying, no, that's another plan. You know, that's another, that's another mission. It's not our mission. Um, you've seen this diagram before, perhaps. Uh, it's super important. It's what makes you unique, genuinely unique. You have the two great, you have the Everest of spikes, which are the two weekly, you know, you have small shoulders, but you have two great spikes, which are the, which are, which are the market. Uh, spikes are terrible for commerce. Any kind of spike is terrible for commerce because it means you have to staff up enormously and staff down, okay? The fact that you, serve, the fact that you can serve, that you can, that you can transport, house, and feed 80,000 people, doubling your population, actually gives rise to something that we, we, uh, we took on and we're counting on, which is that you're logistical geniuses, okay? There's a huge amount of software in this town in terms of organization, Formal and informal, in terms of organization. Uh, by the way, I wonder, uh, I really don't like that light because what it is is washing out the slides. Could we take it off, please? That light up there, and you don't, certainly don't need to see me. Thank you very much. Wow, this university is so efficient. <laughs> do you know what's it like at Harvard? You need to bring the union in to do that. <laughs> Amazing. So anyway, uh, these spikes are terrible for commerce. The only thing they're good for, absolutely uniquely, is your tax base. 
but it has made our life incredibly difficult. Because not only are you open, you need to have huge capacity buildings, but then actually they don't really die so that we can rehabilitate them. They're closed, they're in hibernation. I've never been to a place where the storefronts are in hibernation, which is to say they're paying lease, but they're not available to, for, our, for our revitalization. Okay, now, look, what I'm, look at what we're confronting. We're the downtown that looks empty, and the storefronts are full and being paid for. And the first thing that I asked the first few meetings is, could you remind me what I'm supposed to do with this? <laughs> what are we supposed to do? Well, of course, we noticed the other phenomena, which is you have an enormous number of parking lots that are not being used. Most surface parking lots are being used. So there's an asset there. And so as, apart from the incredible sort of logistical genius that you have, the ability to feed people with food trucks and transportation, you also have parking lots. Okay, now notice the ingredients that we're working with. Your goodwill, parking lots, and management genius. Okay. Uh, spikes. This is what happens if you were to get yourself a baseball field, not to be recommended. First of all, you're competing with, you know, that's been done nearby. You still get spikes. In, in a, this is what happens when you get, this isn't too bad, these are movies. You get weekend spikes, it begins to even out. Uh, this is a university, pretty good. Universities are better, the students come in, unfortunately they have vacations, summer vacations. It's hard to survive. The pizza joints, the people who actually feed and, uh, and amuse the students and support the students, they have a difficult time when the students are out. So, but there's nothing, nothing, nothing as bad as the spikes you have. It is absolutely extraordinary. I don't think it's another place that only has two humongous conventions a year. Even those people who have convention centers even out the conventions. And by the way, there isn't a square foot available to have conventions in between. So it's very, very difficult for commerce to thrive. Now, of course, what you want is a mixed-use downtown. What we're after, what everybody's after, the only way commerce is going to survive is when people live, work, amuse themselves, and shop downtown with a summer hiatus like that. And this is what allows, this is what allows a downtown to happen. There is no other way known. We need to get this to be a downtown, a downtown that's mixed use. Now, okay, advantages. So far, I've only mentioned, I've mentioned three advantages. I want to emphasize that the greatest one is your biggest threat, which is your tax base, that the tax base comes substantially from one great monoculture. If that monoculture sneezes, there's not much of a plan B. You know, already your housing uh, taxes are higher than your competing cities nearby. So this is a place without a plan B. What I would hope is that this, the way to think about this is that by making this commercially viable in a different way, and the analogy I'm gonna make and make again is you have a dinosaur, okay? The dinosaur is magnificent. And I think you know it, it's a famous down, it's a brontosaurus. Magnificent. What we're, but if something happens to that brontosaurus, it collapses and crushes everything around and there's no plan B. What we're trying to bring in now are little mammals. Little mammals, little mammals, little mammals. And what we'd like to do is over the decade, the coming decade, is have these mammals achieve the same biomass as the dinosaur. So you keep the dinosaur, but in case something happens to the dinosaur, which needs this tremendous fodder, magnificent, but two tons of fodder a day, what we'd like to have is a thousand, two thousand young, sharp entrepreneurs that can live on two acorns a day. But together, they will add up to the same thing as the biomass. That's the great plan B. The plan B is to enable a lot of people to act. Now, what's the good news about this? First of all, you're well located, we know that. This is one of the reasons, by the way, this fantastic location in the middle of everything is one of the reasons that this will survive, that the dinosaur survives. 
It is at the center of the East Coast. They can do what they like in Las Vegas. They can do what they like in Atlanta. They can do what they like in California. You still have a tremendous radius for delivery. And remember that furniture is bulky and expensive to transport. It's one of the things that is of considerable cost. And so it's not only the tradition that you have of having done this for a very long time, you're really well located. Uh, uh, and not only nationally, but look at this. And this is the key. This is your greatest asset. Within a 60-minute walk, there are 226,000 students. I repeat that, 226,000 students. And within a 75-minute drive, there's 335,000 students. Unbelievable. Youth in quantity. Youth in quantity. And they will drive 60 minutes, and they will drive 75 minutes if you can actually keep them occupied between two to three hours. Okay, right now, there, none of them are driving here. And by the way, this is way beyond High Point University. These are all of these colleges, all of these colleges. By the way, the ones in the dark ink are the design schools that are nearby. These are, these are places that have interior design departments, architecture departments. You're very, very design intensive. If I've asked Ben, our local partner here, to find all the other schools within the 75 minutes, and what you have is, 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 a, is, a, is a, it's an intensely creative college crowd. I don't think it's out of the question to estimate that 50,000 students graduate from within 75 uh, minutes drive. 75 miles, 75 minutes drive, 50,000 students graduate, what can you do to capture them? Remember, they're looking for the next thing. You know, it's not only after senior year, after graduate school, you suddenly have educated people, 50,000 educated kids saying, what next? Okay, tremendous privilege. Our economic plan here is to capture as many as possible, to make this the place where they come. Now. Beautiful, look at how it glows dark here. Look at the circles of the universities. You know, this north-south axis here is actually where most of them are. It's a fantastically well-located town in terms of proximity to schools. So this is what we have to work with. You have an extraordinarily sprawled out city. Really bad job, by the way. Really bad job. Uh, there are people north of here that have no clue what's going on downtown. That's more than once that we saw the repeated concern. What are we gonna do about the people up there? The people up there belong just as surely to Winston-Salem as they do to, uh, or to uh, Greensboro as they do to High Point. Okay, there's nothing we can do. You know, they are incredibly fluid. By the way, sprawl, as you may know, doesn't have a future. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't serve the aging population well. The aging folk, at some point, they stop driving. They can't live in suburbia. It literally does not support them. Atlanta is very worried about this, and, but unlike you, they're doing something about it. And of course, the young people who grew up in suburbia think that suburbia is uncool. Uh, they want to be downtown. They are uh, getting licenses. There was a uh, 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 New York Times, I think, last week. Uh, I think 13% fewer licenses per age. Uh, than the prior generation. You know, it's all about downtown. So the people, everything indicates that you have young people that like downtown and they're going to be the pioneers. Now, a little, a little, uh, just a little lesson uh, about how this happens. And I'm going to try to make this very clear. Okay. The pioneers are always the young people that have an eye and have a need and no money ever, okay? What they need to incubate a business is cheap real estate, okay? Really cheap real estate. And it goes from the garage startups to Henry Ford. I mean, everything starts with cheap real estate. Cheap real estate used to be readily available from, for 100 years, from the left bank of Paris, which was a slum that was pioneered by the artists, and it became cool in 1870 to 1970 when people plowed into Soho and they moved into the, they moved into the warehouses and the mills. How were they able to do that? They did it under the radar of the municipal authorities. 
In other words, they didn't renovate to code. Okay? The minute, now, what has happened since 1970 is a culture of, of uh, bureaucracy and administration that has made it literally impossible for people to incubate businesses. So what arose to come up with this is the public-private partnership. Why did we need public-private partnerships for the first 300 years? You know, how did we used to do it? Why suddenly now can nothing be done unless they use public money or tax breaks or whatever? Because the government itself made it impossible to do anything affordably. And it's not just the amount of money. Have you ever seen a small developer lately? They can't. They can't amortize, you know, renovating a small building, renovating a small restaurant, renovating six houses a year, building six houses a year. The process of bureaucratic approval cannot be amortized by the small developer. So everything's a big developer. People have to come from Charlotte. People have to come from this. Everybody, it's the baby boomers still doing all the development because the young people can't do a damn thing. And government has caused that. So if we want to bring the young people this, like, you know, I'm not a libertarian here, okay? I'm not sort of ideological. You know, we're confronting the fact that your only chance is bringing the young people and they can't do it unless we lift the regulatory regime so that they can make use of the assets that you have without making them so expensive that in fact they have to go elsewhere. We have completely sterilized the potential the bureaucratic problem of expensive real estate has sterilized the potential of the young people, of the coming generation. And by the way, that's only the beginning of it is the real estate. That's one I deal with. Just starting a business at all is so difficult that it has driven half the kids to be artists because they can't cook anything without a permit, because they can't sell anything they cook without a permit, because they can't repair a damn thing without a permit, like nothing. I could never have started my office in 1974 I could never have confronted, you know, uh, in that recession of 74, I would have had to work for somebody, somebody else. But it was so much easier to start. And my clients were 30 years old. And we just, we just did it. We did it, and that's gone. And I think it's not only profoundly unfair to the coming generation, it doesn't work. It's not going to work for them. And only those places that are light, light on the bureaucracy are going to succeed. And you know where those places are? in other countries. Do you want to get anything done in Miami? <laughs> go to Panama City. Do you want to get anything done in Texas? And that's pretty libertarian. Go to Mexico. It isn't just cheap labor. It's the ability to get on with it that's important. So one of the things that's out, going to be so creative about this proposal is we're going to pioneer here. And I've already gotten some thumbs up from people involved, from some of your elected officials, certainly from the city manager. Thumbs up on getting on with it and trying to recruit, you know, uh, getting ahead of that curve and making this place the coolest place where the young people automatically come. So that's a huge theme. Now, there's also the older folk, you know, who also need their restaurants, their walkability. There are the families that need their kids and want to come downtown. And we were fortunate because it didn't happen this way, but the sites that we were given, the downtown site, the uptown site, the, the Dead Mall and the so-called College Village were perfect to hit each one of those, uh, that's was sheer luck, to hit one of the, to hit some of uh, all of these segments. So here's the sites that we have. By the way, it looks like an enormous, it looks like very small. Do you see how small that is in your city? It's actually huge. This is really, really, really huge. There's no way you can walk from one to the other of these places. You will always drive. And so we have a problem of breaking it down into separate areas, and uh, that's what we have. Okay, so these are the projects. You will be receiving a report that breaks this down into independent. They're mutually supportive projects, but they're independent. This project 1D, this project uh, 1C, 1A, 1B, etc. It's going to be very, very clear. It's going to be a thin report, very clear about what is to be done in each of those places. You know, again, I'm, 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 this is. You know, none of these old planning reports are this thick, you know, getting on with it, which stay on the shelf. Okay, so this is it. We were originally, it was originally thought that we would do with the uptown area, okay? And the uptown area, which is Main Street, 
uh, from up here, I, uh, the Wellborn uh, Street area, all the way to the library, came into being because the wires were to be buried, the overhead wires. There's a, you know, poor America. There is so much faith that revival will ensue when you have a sign ordinance and when you have, when you bury your overhead wires. <laughs> okay. Well, the bad news is that's not even not enough. It hardly gets you off the ground. I mean, it just, it doesn't even raise your spirits, as I'll show you. You're just putting money down the rat hole, okay? Unless you follow up with the whole street space, the, the so-called complete streets. Okay? Now, one of the things I thought about today, by the way, I have grown, we, the team, has grown rather, rather fond of your public services department and your transportation department and your other department because although they were as grumpy as any of those people ever are at the beginning, they have actually responded with incredible agility to our, to our, and the only pro, yes, they deserve it. I mean, incredible agility. Do you realize that when we started working on the library down here, I'll show you, last Wednesday at about three o'clock in the afternoon, we we're trying to make the library the southern termination of the pedestrian way, you know, your public library, and we heard that a six-laner was not about to be built, was being built there already. I hear it at three o'clock, we present an alternate. I realized that we had to, we had to basically upset that apple cart very quickly. I presented at, I presented at six, you may have heard that. Eight o'clock, I get a call that night, or Wendy gets a call saying, you're meeting with the city manager at eight, who's gonna set up a meeting with the, the, basically the public works team. By nine o'clock, 9.30, the city manager had actually, they had agreed to give it a chance. By a day later, they had, they had stopped the work in that area of the site of the road, gone a mile south, we're working down there. We could see it the next day. The, you know, the, the machines weren't there. They were, uh-oh. Uh Matt, oh, there it is. Was it coming up? <laughs> uh, the, um, it's sensitive, I shouldn't touch it. Okay, <laughs> sensitive. It's the only sensitive thing here in this whole city. <laughs> you guys are tough. Anyway, um, by the next day, in spectacular fashion, like it was something like 1944, you know, when Americans could actually make a decision, the next day, it was done. Our engineers were with en their engineers. Yesterday, six, seven, eight engineers were there. <laughs> it wasn't our design in the end, but it was pretty close to our design. It was absolutely argued through, and there it was. I mean, just done. It was fantastic. I would like to make just one suggestion. Um, I think that public works should be unified. Because part of the problem, or one of the things we discovered, is that these various departments were delighted to talk to each other. And they didn't know that, you know, we're rebuilding this and this pipe is 100 years old, et cetera. One of the things we did by stirring the pot is we got these people to talk to each other. And just the fact that they get along, which they do, doesn't mean they're talking to each other. I think you should have a unified public works department in which everybody's in it, just like we did in the charrette. Everybody in the same room, every specialist talking to each other continually. Because we did discover an absence of coordination. The best thing that happened in this is, is that all these people were working together for the first time in a long time. And that's why I'd like to go back to the old public works department, in which the entire agenda of the public space in this city, the entire complete street, which is the public realm in America, is handled in a coherent way rather than by specialists. Anyway, so that was a great story. Now, we were given this whole thing, and uh, we did some scale comparisons. And one of the things we did is we thought that's much, much, much too long, okay? Much too long. The first thing we did is we clipped the upper portion and said, take that money and let's spend it down here where it really matters. But this is our proposal. Our proposal is only here, this, this length. And I'd just like to say that this length is longer than the Main Street by maybe 25% than the Main Street in Greensboro, okay? 
So that's much more than you need. So let's just concentrate the excellence. I think trying to, trying to spread it too thin, you'll end up with mediocrity. So we'd like to take a lot of that budget and actually put it together and do what the next proposal is like. Okay, this is something else in the wrong place. Uh, these are the existing buildings that you have very disaggregated. Uh, let me just orient you. This is Maine. This is, uh, this is Jefferson. This is Ferris. Lexington. Lexington, sorry. Jefferson is Peter. Oh, no, that's Freeman. Uh, <laughs> Lexington and Ferris, which turned out to be the center of everything and the library at the end. Okay. And the scheme that we have is we leave this to later. We did the design. You know, uh, uh, this is called what would? Uh, Wellburn. Wellburn up here. It's designed. It's fully designed. Definitely second stage. We'd like to go from a gateway, essentially a great symbolic, spectacular gateway here in this intersection to another gateway at the library. But the actual center is the intersection of Farris, which we call the uh, Farris Crossroads, because of the very large number of people that live in the other so on both sides within walking distance of it. You know? And of course, the inn, the Adams Inn, is the beginning of it. The Adams Inn um, um, uh, catalyzes everything. So this is, this, this is the additional stuff. See, there it is. Remember, what we're trying to do is every new building heals the place, makes it more pedestrian friendly. We're trying to mask the parking lots. The parking should be in the back. People will never walk past an open parking lot. It's a hostile environment. They'll walk past a building, particularly if it's a shop front. So you'll see that the strategy here is to fill in the gaps and to heal it. By the way, this is pretty interesting here. It's very complex. It could be really terrific. But in black are the great healing buildings that we're inserting. We also discovered that the code used to build the, the north of Farris and south of Farris were different. And so we're, we've done a very refined, very precise code. And I'm going to end by speaking of the code and how important it is that the code be light, that the code be part of the solution and not just simply uh, uh, be part of the problem, which it's, uh, it has been and it promises to be. So. Uh, so this is what it's like, okay? Not a, from the air, too many black roofs, but this is Farris. The inn is terrific. The inn's extension is terrific. This might join the inn. By the way, this is in the long range. This should join the inn, and there should be no impediment. You have terrible uh, sort of boxy buildings, obviously. When this becomes really nice, this will go away. And then you have an incredibly dull bank. What could be duller than a bank? Hardly anything. <laughs> and we're, we're, it's important. You, of course, have a great Episcopalian church here. This is a great intersection. It requires repair only here with the bank. And so what we're, you'll see that we're scabbing on a kind of cafe to the front of the bank. Um, this is the drawing that we did of it to understand it. It becomes much clearer when you draw it. You can see the flat, non-contributing building. You can see the big gap that's made here. And then this is what this is what we propose to do. Uh, notice that the gaps have been filled. Notice.